3,000 um, are on active some form of probation uh, supervision. And with that scale, there is a subset uh, that um, really intersects with all the challenges that are being described here today, and it's really our pleasure to learn about this. Um, one of the, uh, I, I recall a, a very classic, unfortunate situation where you have the young person that turns 18 and the family that they've been with uh, says, you're done, you got to go. And that's, that's it. There's a, there's a level of hot potato at that point and they're still spending some time on probation. We have some planning, discharge planning to do, et cetera. And you have a challenge where the, the parent or guardian at that point is saying, I have enough and there's other children to deal with and they have to make it on their own and the probation officer and colleagues that we work with in the community are having to figure out what to do with that young adult, youthful adult, and uh, that's something of a, of, a, of a regular occurrence. But a challenge is also how I'm, I'm coming to grips with this. I actually think I need to apply for training hours credit for this because I'm learning so much and, and there's, uh, and this is a gap. Uh, the gap is that I, I don't think un, until we were welcomed uh, to this, we're not paying attention to this. Uh, we actually have uh, um, officers specializing in um, uh, addressing trafficking needs uh, for uh, chronic runaways and uh, if we're flagged in various ways, some of our uh, young ladies who are on probation, we, we work uh, uh, across agencies to help address trafficking. But I have to say getting statistics on this even being aware that uh, some subset of our probation-involved youth are homeless or precariously housed, as I'm hearing the phrase used, I, I think we have to do better at uh, capturing where the need is and then recognizing that there are familiar agencies that we bump into routinely, but we're not maybe formalized about that. Well, that's, isn't that part of what this program and this new effort that's being launched is about? I mean, we're, we're all in. You're all in? <laughs> work directly with homeless youth, so I would say that the way that I experience them is the way most people in our community do when I see them out on the streets and in the community and when I don't see them when they're there, but I don't know who they are. Um, and, you know, I, it, it's inexcusable in a, in a country as resourced as ours to, to have this issue, and I think we all agree with it, and, and that's why we're here. Um, I think there are many challenges. One is, in particular right now, is our state budget and the you know, tragic impact that it's having on the work that many of you are trying to do. Um, Jerry mentioned a, a number of things that are working. I do think we have many things that are working and to be proud of, but we need more of those same things and more of other things, right? We have some great emergency housing, we have some great interim housing, but we need more of it and, and we need different models of it. Um, and I think that um, one of the challenges is, Marianne Philbin is here and I'm gonna, Marianne's from the Pierce Family Foundation and you know, one of the things that Marianne always says is that if it's not in somebody's job description to do something, then it doesn't get done because we all have other things that we're doing with those jobs, right? We don't have anybody as a centralized person whose job responsibility it is to say, I am going to bring together these sectors, I am going to figure out how to engage these folks, I am going to look at what's happening as best practices in other communities and other countries so that we can learn from them. So sort of a homelessness czar, so to speak? Yes. Yeah. So is that, is that something that you think we could the community could find funding for either through Polk Brothers or through other sources? I absolutely do. Polk Brothers Foundation is interested in supporting such a position and I think the question is, you know, what is the community's interest in that position and where should it go? And I will just say um, to Commissioner Morrison Butler, you know, I mean I think uh, I felt for a long time that training and capacity building is something that's needed more. I hear from the agencies that we work with that you need it more within your own agencies. But you know, some of this cross-sector work, I think, is a terrific opportunity for foundations to be um, engaged and helpful and supporting. What about that, Lisa? 
I think that would be a great idea, and we're trying to figure out different ways to do it. I will tell you, by the way, uh, although don't tell my boss I said this. Um, I believe it is Houston. I'm looking at members of my team that has a deputy chief of staff on homelessness in the mayor's office. Um, the mayor did launch an interagency task force. There are 14 different agencies that touch the homeless, some not so deeply and not so positively, others very deeply and very supportively. So just trying to get our own house in order is no easy feat. Um, you know, I, so I, I do think that focusing people on it um, is very helpful. I'll tell you that from our standpoint, when we look at the delegate agency community, um, there are, you know, I'm not sure that there's a clear answer on the right way to build the capacity. As I'm looking at Chapin Hall, because we always work with our University of Chicago uh, at Chapin Hall, our friends on everything. There's some, uh, some things to be thought about. Is there value, for instance, in building the individual staff capacity at the, in, in the entire delegate agency community? Yes. Is another option maybe to build a backbone sort of organization that could serve multiple partners is that another way to do it because you know this idea around being data savvy we all want that now um, and yet does everyone have the ability on their individual staffs to go hire that research person so maybe is there a way to do research and some of that stuff for a group of agencies mm -hmm. I'm not exactly sure what the method is what I can tell you is that at different levels and at different tables this concept of how you work collaboratively, this concept of collective impact is really catching on. We just can't quite figure out yet um, how to formalize it and structure it. You know, as the collaboration is already happening. Um, you're learning from that. So what are some of the lessons learned? Some, what have been some of the successes and perhaps even more important failures so far, either in, in terms of the collaboration or in terms of strategies around this issue that we should be aware of? Well, Watch words. So, for example, for us um, uh, at the city, for DFSS, we, we were fortunate enough to partner with a couple dozen uh, delegate agency partners over the last two years on the Ending Veterans Homelessness Initiative. And the first thing is we haven't ended it. Um, you know, so it's not like you can celebrate. We haven't ended veterans homelessness. What we realize is that every month, new individuals become vulnerable, and we are, number one, learning to understand the vulnerabilities. Number two, we also have seen some of the flaws in our own process. Um, we talked a little bit uh, here about some of the triggers. At DFSS, our job essentially is to engage you once you're homeless. So by definition, that's inefficient. Mm -hmm. So there's all sorts of triggers for homelessness that we don't own the data to. Um, and it's, it's easy to talk about, well, let's all share the data. But oh, by the way, we only talk about sharing the data when we're talking about um, core communities. Um, the rest of us don't want everybody sharing our data. Um, so we do have to figure out how you share the data that you need in order to support people and at the same time you don't want everybody rumbling around in your data. Uh, we, don't, we don't talk about sharing the data of people that go to New Trier High School. We only talk about sharing okay. the data of CPS students. So we have to figure some of those things out. Thank you. So, it, Well here's some, some data from the jail. When we look at people who come into the jail who self-identify as being homeless. And that's already problematic because a lot of people, because of the stigma of homelessness, when they go before a bond court judge, many um, individuals are reluctant to reveal that they're homeless because then they think the judge will see that through the lens of, how do I know you'll be back in court? Mm -hmm. um, but when we look at the numbers of people who do say up front that they are homeless, we look at the averages, and they have an average of nine prior bookings when they come into our custody. So here's, here's one story. We currently have a 26-year-old um, uh, man in our custody. He has, been, he has been with us on 51 different occasions, 51 times. He's been booked in the jail, and he's 26 years old. He was um, thrown out of his house by his grandma when he was 18 years old. And, and his crime is homelessness. He comes in on criminal trespass to property. He found a motel that he can break into when he, he goes in there. Um, again, the, the, um, the difficulty in doing effective discharge planning. All of these cases are, are, real, are complicated by 
substance abuse or mental illness, and they're really tough. Even when, even when we can find shelter space for them, the shelters probably aren't youth oriented. And you know, so now we have this 26-year-old, and it's it's terrifying. I, on the other end of that, we have a 61-year-old man again in our custody. He's been booked into the jail 141 times. He has never been to the State Department of Corrections, which gives you an example of how minor his charges are. They are what we call crimes of survival. He steals to get food, um, or he seeks shelter um, uh, from the elements. He gets, Sorry, uh, again, arrested for criminal trespass. If you string the amount of time he spent in our custody together, he spent 12 of the last 20 years locked up. And you know, and that's because we, for him, it's probably too late to intervene. Yeah. But we've we've got to get these 18 to 24 year olds when they come in and, and really figure out a solution. Have you have there, you had any conversations with the sheriff's office about this intervention strategy? Are you experimenting and <laughs> yeah. looking? At yeah, any we have done um, we've done a, a variety of research projects mm -hmm. trying to identify what what we call sort of a frequent flyer population and um, reach out to community partners to get them involved. Right now, a program that we have going is aimed at 18 to 24 year olds. Not all of them are homeless, but we're doing um, intensive programming with um, cognitive behavioral therapy, um, and we're hoping to scale that out to other populations. And these community partners are like, like what kinds of agencies are they? Um, the Chicago Urban League, North Lawndale Christian Associ Association, um, build, SARE, folks who are out in the community who can do wraparound services. So if people need housing, they can provide that if they need counseling, job training. It's, it's all of the problems, you know, education, mm -hmm. all of the problems that we know can lead people to our door to begin with. This is all really important rich information. I know, Avik, you said you're learning a lot, but you've also got a lot to, to share. Um, any reaction to what you've heard, any strategies, any successes, failures that you want to point to? And I was really particularly intrigued by your point earlier about we don't highlight this enough. We don't know enough about it. It's not, the problem is not well known. What do we need to do about that? Be, you know, this campaign is, is going to be one way, but what other things should we be doing to highlight and get, and get people on board? Thank you. Um, so in, in, in preparing sort of a, a point of orientation for, for our department, I, I, I'm looking at this young adult population, and I have to say that in juvenile court, and juvenile probation, we're, we're rather programmed as these are our children, this, these are children involved in the court system that perhaps other systems have failed or written off. And then when we're using those terms children, we're thinking of the 14-year-old, 15-year-old, etc. About 45% as of earlier this week are 18 or older on our population, about 1,300 young people. And the top six neighborhoods uh, represented in that young adult population that, that I'm seeing we're talking about similarly here uh, is Lawndale, Back of the Yards, West Garfield Park, Hyde Park, Washington Park, Woodlawn uh, as one zip code, South Chicago, Auburn, Gresham. It's possible that if we all had to guess different lists, there would be a lot of overlap as to where you're thinking the need is, etc. So when I'm looking at how do we switch on the lights so that we're more aware of this need, I'm looking at those neighborhoods that are sort of heavily represented in our population and what are the kinds of resources. And Hanky, you just put out a number of agencies that we're also quite plugged into doing that hard work on, on the ground. But our point of entry isn't necessarily the triggers of, of homelessness that we should be more mindful of. And so I'm thinking that there's a, a great deal of opportunity for us to anchor the entry point in the juvenile justice population to look at the 18 and older young people that we're working with because I think we can do a lot more development of our continuum anchored around the services of uh, finding home, you know, homelessness support, etc. If we get more familiar with that continuum, I'm thinking that's the young adult support continuum that we need to plug into for probation involved youth. So that's very exciting. Yeah. Great. And Debbie, uh, again, you're coming from the philanthropic world. Um, any lessons, um, successes or failures that would be instrumental for people to hear? 
it doesn't even necessarily have, necessarily have to be around this population that, that you've learned as, as, a, as a philanthropist for folks who are in a room who want to in, interact with you. And what, what do you need as a philanthropist? What are you looking for from this community to do what, to do what you can for this community? Um, sure. So, uh, let's say lessons learned. Um, well, I think, I think philanthropists and foundations have a, an opportunity to take risks and to fund innovative um, programs and, and programs that, uh, the, that the government is not yet ready to support. And so there are, um, and so I think there are programs that we have supported that have been effective and have gone well, and programs that haven't. And I think that's a terrific learning opportunity. Um, I think that um, we do also tend to fund in silos, and I think we need to do more of what we're talking about here today in your sectors as well, right? So I'm leaving here today to go to a Heartland Alliance conference that's bringing together employment and uh, a focus on homelessness, right? Those are things that are also just starting to happen, so how do we bring those uh, sectors together more? Um, um, uh, Hinky and Avic mentioned a, a number of, of folks from different kinds of sectors and different organizations that aren't, we're not engaging in these conversations and so we need to think about how to bring those in together. Um, what do I need? Um, I, first of all I want to say that, you know, I, I mentioned Marianne Philbin is here and um, uh, uh, the, the VNA Foundation is also here, and there may be some other funders I don't know about um, that are also in the room. But I think what we need is, um, you know, there, I, you know better than I know what needs to be done. Um, I want to, I want to use our limited resources, right, to make investments that really promote systems change. So I need to know. How, how to do that, what kinds of things do you want to do. Voices of Youth Count is a great example, and it, I should just say we're very lucky to have Brian here. There's some very modest people in this room. You know, Brian, um, Voices of Youth Count is happening because Brian thought it should happen. I'll just say Commissioner Morrison Butler mentioned the, um, the interagency council that the mayor started. It, I, I have to say that I think it was Lisa Morrison Butler that really wanted that to happen and made it happen. Um, but Voices of Youth Count is a great um, example. We're going to be provided with this um, wealth of information and wealth of resources. We need to be ready, right? We need to be ready. How are we going to use that information to advocate for what we want and need here? If I can understand from you all, right, what those needs are, what you want to happen, then we can, then we can help with that, right? We can help we can help set that up, we can help um, provide people to help think through it, we can help, you know, this HUD application, we can help with grant writers, we can help with connections to communities in other um, states and cities and countries that are doing this work. So I think, you know, it, funders can, can make grants and give money, but I also think that we can help with um, collaborations and connections. I hope someone's taking notes on that. She just put a pretty good list on the table there. <laughs> Thank you. You mentioned too that um, the, this this issue has been um, really under the gun because of state budget cuts, and that brings politics and government into the conversation. We have a election, local and national elections, in two weeks. So any one of you, if you want to respond, it's going to be my last question, and then get ready for your questions because I'm going to go to you. Um, what what what's the outlook for? Uh, the elections are going to be opportunities. What's what's pending out there, either in the state legislature, in city council, in Washington, beyond some of the things we've already discussed that um, we, we need to be aware of and we need to be working on. Anyway. Well, uh, I'm part of a national group of funders that are working on homelessness issues and that do. Um, national advocacy uh, around issues that are important um, to local communities and um, you know one of the things that we talk about a lot is that um, homelessness is a bipartisan issue I mean it it makes sense it makes sense from a moral perspective and it makes sense from a financial perspective 
Um, it is much less expensive, as, 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 as most of us in this room know, to provide um, services and housing than it is to serve people through a system on an ongoing basis. So uh, somebody mentioned earlier Away Home America, which is a new coalition and um, collaboration amongst a variety of key stakeholders. National Network for Youth is playing a role in that. Um, and they, Away Home America, has come out with a transition plan um, and information on um, how to advocate for um, changes. And, and no matter, you know, no matter what party is elected, uh, in nationally and locally, and it's got very specific information about reauthorization levels for. Um, programs in HUD and HHS, but in also some of the more unlikely programs, and uh, I, I, it's been a helpful resource to me, and I think um, it would be beneficial to look at. Has that been put in the hands of uh, the, you know, the campaigns? Has that transition plan has been getting pushed on with the campaigns? Yes. yes. <laughs> Very good. To the best of their ability, yes. I think, at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Given this campaign, go ahead. One thing I want to I appreciate the, the importance of the election, but one of the most interesting uh, things that I've seen in this year that I've been at DFSS is there is, I always forget the city, more is it Seattle? Some city in the U.S., the media played a huge role in helping the entire city have a conversation for one day about homelessness. Oh, that was so everyone, that was every television station, every radio station, every newspaper, covered homelessness for one day. They weren't told how to cover it, so if it got on your nerves, you could be critical. If it tore at your heartstrings, you could be emotional. Whatever you wanted to do, you could do it. But for one day, there was a conversation about homelessness. So I would like your help to see if we could do that here. Because one of the things I am really struck by is the ignorance that exists in our community about how people come to the street. We are frustrated and angry with them for being in our way. I can't tell you how many elected officials uh, get calls from homeowners in their community. So the homeowners get to be hidden, but they are often the ones that are saying, I don't want to roll my baby carriage past so-and-so. I raised both my daughters right downtown. My oldest daughter graduated from Georgetown two years ago, rolling past homeless people, did not keep her from going to Georgetown. It did not make us less safe. It bothered us. It should have made us feel ashamed, but it sure didn't get in the way of her getting through college. And so we have to do something to have a conversation because there isn't a single layer of our community that can solve this alone. But if everybody, if everybody really, really wanted to pitch in, then we could actually do something about this. But we allow people to hide in the background and then their hidden voices, they find their way into our policy, into our decisions, into our funding. And so, I'm sorry, I'm just like, I'm, I, I, I do this, I get on a roll. I, I apologize, but it's really frustrating to allow this conversation to exist the way it does in the shadows. It's yes, a very powerful point, and, and I think it was San Francisco that you were referring to, and that was a, a pretty unique and amazing effort because journalists and, and, and uh, media organizations never collaborate on anything. Right. We're, we're vicious competitors, as Hanky knows. So uh, I, I heard it was very successful. I think one of the impetus for it was, too, that because of some of the same comments that you're describing here, people who are wealthier sort of shunning the homeless. Uh, there was a lot of political conversations at city council around you know, passing new laws. It would be anti-homeless, and I think that was sort of the impetus for getting that conversation going, so it's a great point. And I can just add that um, in Seattle, um, I know that there were a couple of foundations that <laughs> made provided resources to reporters over a period of a year to write stories on homelessness, and they were not restricted to you know what kinds of stories. It was just go out and talk about these issues and bring this more to public attention. I would love to do something like that here. Um, it's not a typical way that our foundation funds, and so I, you know I need your help in doing that. So if I, you know, if I can get a groundswell of asking for that, right? If if we can talk with the city and say that this is something that we feel like is important, I, I think it, it was enormously helpful there. I mean, to see some of the articles that were written was really it was quite impressive. Can we move to? Unless you guys wanted to chime in, we move to the to the Q Q and A.